Oh, hello everybody. This is the first of uh, a mini series of um, teachings uh, from the book of Zechariah, really about the anointing. And uh, this one is about the necessity, the absolute vital necessity of walking in your anointing. And uh, I'm really doing this as a fulfillment of that very idea, really, at the um, prompting of a couple of people to put a teaching on Facebook or wherever, and uh, just to sort of get a ministry and anointing going again, because I haven't taught properly um, for some years. And I'd say it is rather peculiar looking at yourself while you're speaking. It causes a bit of a weird feedback loop and um, almost get overcome with self-consciousness, thinking, mm, I really need to trim my beard or get rid of it entirely or my eyebrows, not get rid of them, but trim them. Um, anyway, without much further ado, I'm going to launch into this 10 minute segment about the necessity of the anointing. I really felt the Lord um, strongly impress me about the church and the need for people to recognize their anointing, to walk in it. And there are all kinds of reasons why people don't walk in their anointing. And the church is the poorer for it. Uh, the kingdom of God needs you you there to walk in your anointing and the church needs you to do it too and uh, we'll look about look at the sort of considerations about how do you know what your anointing is growth in your anointing the fact that just because you're anointed doesn't mean you instantly step into something david king david was anointed king many years before he actually became king, but he took steps towards that kingly anointing. And uh, we grow in measure of faith. We grow in confidence. We grow in ability. Uh, Timothy was enjoined by the Apostle Paul to um, show due diligence, take pains in your anointing and the things that he was anointed to do. And uh, that's something that we will need to have a look at. And also the things that prevent us walking in the anointing. There are m many a multitudinous things that are blockages in the way. Anyway, let me read to you from the book of Zechariah. Uh, it contains some very well-known scriptures and some rather strange, visionary, prophetic experiences. Uh, so beginning in chapter four, verse one, then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was awakened from his sleep. But presumably Zechariah had just been slain in the spirit by the appearance of an angel. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with its bowl on the top of it. And it's seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps, which are on the top of it. Also two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left side. And I said to the angel who was speaking with me, saying, what are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, don't you know what these are? And I always find it interesting that angels always seem completely shocked that people don't understand these visionary experiences. Things that are patently obvious to an angel are anything but obvious to us. Uh, and that goes for a lot of prophetic visions, utterances. Sometimes they're hard to understand. But anyway, Zechariah's lucky he's got an angel on hand to explain it. And I said, no, my Lord. And he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel was the leader, perhaps the king, or certainly perhaps part of the royal family, of the returnees from um, uh, 
Babylon, <laughs> um, when they came back under orders from uh, Cyrus to return from whence they'd been uh, uprooted to rebuild Jerusalem. And this whole book of Zechariah and Haggai too is about rebuilding the temple of God. And it was a task that seemed monumental. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, not by might, not by human might, not by power, human power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountain? Mountains always represent obstacles in the Bible, or usually they represent an insurmountable obstacle. Remember, in those days, people didn't tend to climb mountains for fun. They were an obstacle. They just had to go around. And uh, before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, a flat place that you can easily cross over. And he will bring forth the top stone of the temple, the final stone, or maybe the, the stone in the archway, with shouts of grace, grace to it. And there's, there's quite a lot in there that's you know, a bit hard to understand, but uh, essentially the, um, the lampstand is, and the, the seven bowls and the seven spouts, seven is a divine, the number of the divine. And so this is about the spirit of God. And, but interestingly, uh, later on, we find out that the two trees, the two olive trees are actually uh, Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the king, or the, the leader. And the, the oil is flowing from them. And in fact, for this, what, what, what the prophet is seeing and hearing is the necessity of the high priest, Joshua, and Zerubbabel in moving in their anointing in order for this job, the rebuilding of the temple, and in fact, the rebuilding of, of, of Jerusalem, although uh, Nehemiah had been instrumental in that. It was really, this is about rebuilding the, the temple. And this task just seemed one that was too hard to Zerubbabel. And probably the high priest, Joshua, thought, well, we're just going to grub around here in the outside in this sort of sanctified place. We're never going to have a proper temple. In other words, they were discouraged. They were uh, in, in a place where they were disconsolate about ever seeing the temple. And we might say the church, the church in this land, the church in the world built to a place of resplendent power. And of course, they were concerned also that the Temple of Solomon, that was magnificent, that magnificent edifice had been torn down by the Babylonians, utterly destroyed. And how would they ever, how would they ever compare? How would they ever build anything as grand as that with the meagre resources they had? And God was coming and bringing an encouraging word by my anointing, not by your power, not by your resources, not by your seeker sensitive service not by your incredible music, not by your ability to entertain and stage things that rival Hollywood or Broadway or the West End, not by being a fantastically gifted orator, not by just selling the best donuts in town or doing incredible works of charity, all good things, nothing wrong with all those things, but by my spirit, by, by what my spirit brings. And so it was highly necessary for Joshua and Zerubbabel to move, to have confidence and walk in their anointing. And it's true for you, too, because gifting would be regarded as the same as anointing. And in Ephesians 4, Paul talks about every part working properly, building the church up in love. And that means walking in your gifting, obviously walking in love and with good character striving to maintain peace, but also moving in your anointing, whether it be gifts of mercy, um, gifts of teaching, healing, prophecy, particularly the gifts of spirit, particularly the supernatural things that we don't find come naturally, strangely enough. Uh, moving in those things. These are the power gifts. These are the power ministries that build the body of Christ locally and internationally. 
And for that to happen, it is absolutely vital. Each Christian knows what their anointing is, has confidence in it, is encouraged in it and and walks in it. And there are many things that would that would stop that. Um, but the point of the anointing is to build and to build things that cannot be built by human might. And uh, we mustn't really trust in those things. The giftings and anointings that come are really Christ himself flowing into the church through the, the presence of his spirit, doing these things which are not um, humanly possible. We want to see things that are humanly impossible, the revamping, the rebuilding, the glorifying of, of the church in this country, in this day and age, then it's going to have to be by people moving in their anointings. And so I think that's, and, that, and their giftings. So that's kind of really what I want to say as, a, as an introduction uh, to these series of uh, teachings to try and galvanise us all, me included, and this is part of it, to in some way move again in your gifting and anointing and not being bashful, not holding back, but going for it again, being encouraged, encouraging one another, because we each need everybody to fulfil their role, their ministry, their calling in the church. Anyway, I think I've emphasised that enough. So, well, I hope this blessed you and uh, we'll see how they go. And um, if nobody watches them, who knows? I may decide it's not worth doing. But if people, just a few people get blessed by it, praise God, we'll continue. So, bye for now from Deepest Dorset.